they usually listen to a podcast or just watch a video and that's it. Kate Bernal has spent over 18 years inside Fortune 500 companies and multi-billion dollar businesses, applying her expertise in tech and leadership to achieve real impactful results. Kate's a serial solopreneur with a passion for simplifying complex systems and making technology work for you, not against you. It all comes down to what kind of business are you running? You've also uh, produced or, or you were assistant producer on a Netflix documentary, What the Health? Could you talk a little bit about that? Up until my early 20s, I was just focused on myself. Uh, I was just focused on myself and no one else mattered, to be honest. I was, I think, probably very selfish. And I think until then I was like, okay, I just need to figure out how to fix this. I am just tired of it. Fix that. The next day I started doing research on, okay, uh, I came across uh, how our diet impacts the environment. And I then went into the ethics side of things, which was the most difficult one for me. And then because of that, I watched a documentary on Netflix called Cowspiracy that basically explains how the industry, the animal agriculture industry affects the environment. So it's basically one of the leading causes of climate change, rainforest destruction, and marine life destruction and all of that. I came across an event in Berkeley, California, and I thought, okay, this is so interesting. I need to go talk to some of the people that have produced this documentary and some of the scientists that have appeared in the documentary. So I booked my tickets, booked my flight, and just went to Berkeley and discussed with the producers of Cowspiracy and decided to get involved as a founder, like a pro providing funds for the for the film. I I thought it was just so interesting. I was a little bit uh, scared, to be honest, just because during the conspiracy documentary, you learn that there is a lot of influence and power behind the decisions that governments make and and how we live our lives. And um, I thought, you know, I'm just putting my a target on my back kind of thing, you know, by just putting my name out there for everybody to see. But I decided that it was just the right thing to do. I have the means, uh, the financial means to support causes that I believe in. And one of those is teaching people how to eat well. And along those lines, of course, and, and while doing that, protect our environment and so on and so forth. So I thought, okay, why not provide funds to these uh, directors and these producers so that they can just basically do the work of putting this information out there and making it accessible for everybody. So that's why uh, it was decided that Netflix was the best way to showcase this documentary and, and, and make it available for everybody to watch in different languages. So it's, it's not only available in English, it's available in many, many languages. So that's how I got involved. Beautifully said. I think you, you have to take the jump and look at the data and discover whether or not that's what you believe. Um, and that it's good to find out either way. You know, it's like, oh, I thought I believed that. Turns out I don't. I believe this. Or I do believe that. I'm glad I made that decision. Either one is equally useful for you. Um, it's always nicer when you can maintain momentum, but uh, I think it's important to, to find that out. So I admire that. Um, and now for over a decade, you have been uh, running your own um, practice where you're helping others. Um, seems like you've been helping others your whole mm -hmm. life. You mentioned being selfish in your youth, but you're certainly making up for it, it seems. Could you talk a little bit about that pivot to uh, starting to being an entrepreneur? Um, I guess before I, I pass it back to you, one thing I noticed is that you, you identify problems and you kind of iterate on solutions and then you try to help others with your discovery there. And I think that's just like built in and almost like seems like it's built into your DNA. And then here you are starting like a, 11 years ago or so, starting Cape Bernal, your, your own practice. Uh, could you talk about that pivot? I pivoted from when I was 12. My first, my first business was simply designing diplomas in publisher and printing them uh, and, and selling them to high schools. Very simple, very, very simple, very easy, very fast. Uh, way of making money. And from there, because of the family business, I also started helping my dad tutor uh, when I was in high school. So I mainly tutor on chemistry. So chemistry, math, 
uh, physics was was never my my forte, even though my my dad loves physics. So it was never my forte. So I focused on math and chemistry. And then I also sold. Uh, I had an IT consulting company, so I sold services. I offer services. And then when I moved to the U.S., I interacted with a lot of international students. So I would help them transition, adapt to the you know American culture, and also help them navigate the financial financial system. When you know, for people who are who have lived their whole lives in North America, they think that probably the the rest of the world works the same way in terms of banking and 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 you know retirement accounts and things like that. But that's that's not true. Um, the the rest of the world doesn't or not. I shouldn't uh, generalize, but many many countries don't really care or um, is not really out there for you to look at your credit score or for you to have a retirement account. Uh, there are countries that don't really quite have that. They have some sort of social security system in place, but they don't, you know, it doesn't work the way that, that it works in here in North America. So I would help them navigate that, adapt. And then also the uh, career mentorship uh, area as well. So I would help people uh, in terms of figuring out what to study if they were, you know, younger. Um, and then if they were uh, professionals or recent graduates, then I will help them figure out how to get a job, how to prepare for interviews, how to write their resumes, cover letters. The last portion of that was uh, for new managers. Since I've been in leadership for so long, I have learned many, many things sometimes or most of the time the, the hard way. So I would teach new managers um, how to run teams for the first time. And, and lastly, then the nutrition uh, aspect of it, like we were discussing earlier with the YouTube channel and the website, um, and then uh, online entrepreneurs. So I help online entrepreneurs uh, use AI to produce uh, content and to you know build a strategy for their for their um, for their business, as well as um, unlocking financial freedom for uh, for people who are resident of Canada or the U.S. Um, people who are under 45. So I have pivoted many, many times. Um, but one thing that is uh, constant is one-on-one -on -one interaction. So I, I don't think I have ever sold um, courses where it's like, okay, it's a transaction. You pay, you get your, your course, and that's it. We, don't, we never talk again. For two reasons I do that. I do it because I have found that people actually transform and achieve true transformation through interaction and, and, and personal uh, mentorship, one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Um, and then also for selfish reasons, like I said, I need that social interaction, that connection with the other person. I need to see the impact that I have on the other person. I need to have that you know, go through that discovery phase with the person, go through that um, transformation first with that person. And I see that people also value that and they don't see that there are many options out there for them to to do that with someone. They usually listen to a podcast or just watch a video and that's it, which is a great start. And I think, like I said before, I started with videos and I started most of my learnings with with videos and on the internet. But I think what happens next that one-on-one -on -one interaction is where, where things really, really change and where magic really happens. And going back to the um, kind of molecule analogy, I think it's a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So while it's nice to maybe uh, go for a walk by yourself or read a book uh, in solitude, I think you also need that in-person interaction because I could never, through all my study, ever see me as you see me right now. You just you know, we, we see each other differently. And you can bring out other people's uh, gifts that they can't see. You can um, highlight blind spots, obviously, that they don't see. And uh, they could ask you questions that you didn't expect. So even the, the student can kind of teach the, the teacher, if you will. There's this symbiotic uh, relationship there with the uh, one-on-one. -on -one. That's interesting. Now, you mentioned um, leveraging AI. Could you talk a little bit about your uh, how did you start using AI and what has that journey been like for you? Yeah, so it's been uh, a little bit over two years. So the first time I heard the word artificial intelligence was back in engineering school. It was nothing like what we see today, right? Uh, it was a very, for me in engineering school, it was a very abstract 
uh, concept. I am really enjoying the practical aspect of it now. So I started using AI just because I've mentioned before, I am just, uh, I love tech and I've always loved tech and that's why I, I have a bachelor's in, in, in engineering. And I, I just wanted to try it, to be honest. I just wanted to try it and see what it was like. Um, so I think it was probably the day that ChatGPT was uh, released or the day after. I started using it every day for every single thing in my life. You know, if I needed to plan a trip, if I needed to figure out how to uh, create a recipe for something, if I needed to figure out whether I was going uh, on the right path in terms of building a strategy for work, I would use it. If I was trying to draft an email and I know that I am a very blunt and direct person and I need to be a little bit more aware of that and and convey my words in a different or my message in a different way in an email, well, I would ask AI, and I still do, to take the role of someone or to take the, or to channel someone specific and say, you know, this is the message that I want to convey, but I, I need to send this to someone that is X, Y, Z, or, you know, has these characteristics or this personality. Can you channel this person uh, or even channel that same person that I'm sending the email to. So what I would do is I would take a bunch of, a batch of emails that that person has sent me before. And I would say, now study and analyze the tone and style of this person. And then I need to send an email to this recipient address or this person. Now I need you to put my words and the message that I want to convey using that tone and style so that the person can actually listen or, to, you know, that person can um, understand what I'm saying. Because at the end of the day, when we communicate with someone, what we want is for our message to come across, right? To, to go through that person. Um, we don't want to just make a point, or at least that's not what I want. I just want to make sure that my message is, is heard. And, do, and of course, sometimes we do want to just, you know, vent, and that's totally fine. But, you know, for, for this specific purpose, I just wanted to get my message across and I wanted this person to listen. So from then, I just started using it not only for text-to-text uh, -text generation, so like ChatGPT, um, I started using it for um, um, translating v uh, videos. So what I would do is, for example, I would find a video in English and if I wanted to share with someone who spoke a different language, I would just uh, input that into a, to a, an AI tool that I have and I would um, add automatically um, a transcription uh, into a different language. And then from there, you know, um, image generation as well. Um, so I use it for everything that you can think of, um, specifically strategy, brainstorming, playing de devil's advocate even. Uh, trying to see whether there is a, a gap in my logic. Um, and it's just kind of like having, like I said the other day, having like an intern. You have to give them or give the AI very, very specific instructions. You have to give it context. You have to give it some some background, the purpose of what you're trying to achieve, and then very specific instructions as to, you know, what what is the output that you are trying to get from them. Um, so I use it for everything and I leave, breathe, sleep AI every single day in every single thing that I do. Um, and I'm just hoping that I can, you know, reach more and more people who are, are, uh, open to learning about artificial intelligence and how they can leverage it for their, for their businesses. I think what I hear a lot is that people will say, well, you know, I don't think this thing works for me, but I think people usually just come with the have the wrong expectations or, or just give the wrong inputs. And of course, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't provide this, the, the right inputs, just like with any intern, right? Or with any employee, if you don't provide the right instructions, well, you're not going to get the best input uh, outputs. Sorry. Right. What are some areas that you think uh, don't lend themselves to AI? Is there anything you've discovered that maybe we shouldn't be using AI for? I would say that anything that requires um, any 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 anything that you would where you would want to keep that human connection, right? So I think it it all comes down to what kind of business are you running, 
what kind of presence do you want to build? How do you want to be portrayed? Um, if if the nature of your business is very transactional and it doesn't really require um, someone doing like a very thorough analysis of something and giving a very detailed explanation to something, uh, then AI can take over. For example, you can create a bot, put it on your website, um, dump a lot of knowledge um, about yourself, about your business, about... Uh, I don't know, uh, how your refund um, policy works, how your cancellation policy works, just very basic information. And then you can have uh, the AI answer questions for you. But now if you want um, to keep that human connection with your client, and for example, you want to, like I, like for example, the, the thing, the, the offers that I, that I have, the services that I offer, I don't, I know that there are some AI tools out there where you can clone yourself. You can actually dump all the information that you have in your brain and dump it into a bot and then let the bot kind of like mentor the person. Um, but again, it comes down to what is it that that customer wants? Do they just want the information and they just want to have a back and forth conversation, you know, in in a, in a chat? And if that's what the person wants, that's great. And if that's the type of connection that you want to have with your client, great. But it all comes down to what is the type of presence that you want to build? What type of connection do you want to build with the person? So I think the answer is more nuanced than just this is the list of things that I think shouldn't um, AI, where AI shouldn't be used. Um, in terms of more specific use cases, I would say I have talked to a lot of people that work in, in fraud. Um, and what they usually do is that they would run some filters uh, first through AI and, you know, machine learning and kind of like detect some some things. Like, for example, you know, when you are out of the country and you use your credit card and you didn't notify your bank, you that would trigger an alert. Right. And that can be done through mach machine learning. But with um, with things that require a more thorough uh you know, investigation, then that needs like a second filter. And that second filter has to be a human. Now, any output, my rule is any output from AI should be reviewed by a human, period, at least for the use cases that I have. Um, that's just, I think, at least at this point, that's that's where, where I'm, um, that, that's kind of like where my, my head goes. Like, I think that's, that's my, my position right now. It's interesting because the human is both the strongest and the weakest link in the chain um, where like AI or, or automation, like using technology, it's very binary. It's like, this is right or this is wrong. This is how I'm programmed. So you can't like reason with it so much um, or use like appeal to its empathy or something like that. And whereas the, the human uh, can kind of bridge that gap, like, oh, in this context, actually, this would be a better outcome, but then simultaneously they could be susceptible to um, perhaps a different type of emotional manipulation or some kind of like words uh, unlocking certain uh, abilities or, or um, access rather, but you need both. Uh, so it's in, like, you can't, you know, you can't replace, it's not like all tech or all human. It's like both together and then iterate because there's going to be new discoveries. Uh, that good, good answer to a kind of a difficult question. Looking back on your illustrious career, and I don't say that lightly, is there anything that you would have done differently knowing what you know now? Hmm. That's a very good question. I used to think that I didn't have a lot of regrets and I don't really have a lot of regrets. In terms of my career, I would say that I wonder if, if, if I had, I, I wonder if I had done things differently, if I, if, if the knowledge that I have acquired would have been imprinted in myself the same way. So I think that l l the journey that I went through was the journey that allowed me to become the person that I am today with, in, with a lot of imperfections for sure, but with a lot of this knowledge that I now can, can offer to others. And I think if things, things had gone in a different way, I would probably not have um, value things also the same way. And I wouldn't have internalized some things the same way. 
So yeah, sure, there are mistakes that I made. So for example, in my first role in leadership uh, at Dell, I, like I said before, I was just just very focused on myself. I was just very focused on on myself, and I think that's that's probably one of the reasons why I was so depressed because I was just not looking outside, uh, and I just I was just focused on myself. Just I was just in my own head, and one of the things that I didn't do right in my first uh, role as a leader was I didn't really want to have human interaction. I you know I would come to work. I wouldn't really say good morning or how are you doing? How is your family and things like that. And this particularly in Latin America is like, people would look at you like, what is wrong with you? Which is basically what they thought of me probably. Um, and after getting some feedback from human resources, because Dell at that point had <clears throat> this activity where they call it brown bag. And they will basically take your whole team with the HR person regardless of whether things were wrong or, or, you know, going well or not. And they would meet with them and get feedback from them and how things are going, what things can be improved and, and how they can be improved. And after I had my conversation with HR, <clears throat> she basically said, these people hate you. <laughs> uh, I think there was only one person that was just doing what I was telling them to do or um, was performing, I should say. And after probably like a month, I decided to just, okay, I'm just going to do this. Not necessarily because I feel like doing it, uh, but I'm just going to do this. Uh, okay. So I started saying, good morning. How are you doing? How is your family? And then all of a sudden it became something just so natural for me that I would just do it. And I was like, oh, actually it feels good to say these things. And actually it feels good to hear how these people are doing. And and then uh, probably like a month or two later after the follow-up from HR, she called me again and I was like, okay, I'm going to get fired, <laughs> definitely. Um, and she basically said, so actually I wanted to talk to you because I don't know what you did. These people love you. I'm like, I thought she was being sarcastic. Um, so I, I said, I just... I just basically, so you gave me feedback. You told me exactly what the problem was. They they gave her very specific things. Like I just mentioned, this person is like a robot. She's not really, she's just telling us what to do. And she's giving really good advice. But you know what? Uh, we just don't connect with her. And um, that's something that I, you know, that I really value. And I always say that they made me, they made me change a lot and, and their feedback had more impact than just me saying, good morning, how you're, you know, how are you, how is your family doing? And, and uh, I lost connection with most of them. Um, but I always think about how such a small piece of feedback can have such a great impact in your life, because I think that's where things kind of like change for me or started to change. Uh, that's, that's when I apply for my Fulbright scholarship. That's when I, started this journey of, hey, I should just, you know, not focus so much on myself and then start focusing on others and, and what kind of impact I have on others. Now seeing that I can have a positive impact on people. So that's, that's one of the uh, worst mistakes that I made, but I think it just made me who I am today and it, it made me learn so much and, and, you know, it just changed my life. You help solopreneurs build a simple, profitable business that they love without overwhelm with Kate Bernal consulting and you help them reclaim their time often while still working a nine to five. Could you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Is there an ideal client? Are there some requirements or can anyone come to you and just with an idea or do you even help them come up with an idea? Like, could you just describe where you meet people and, and how you take them on that journey. Yeah, so for sure. So I am teaching what my parents have been doing for decades. I'm teaching them what I have been doing for decades. So I'm teaching them what I know. I'm teaching them what I have learned works and doesn't work, um, you know, from all these companies that I have worked for and what I have learned myself in my own journey. So the ideal client would be someone that is uh, usually under 45 years old. 
uh, doesn't matter where they live, um, doesn't matter whether they have an idea or not. Uh, they don't need to have any background experience in business. So the only thing they need is to have knowledge. Uh, and I usually what I, knowledge that they want to share, I should say, knowledge that I want, that they want to share. And I usually uh, tell people that, you know, there is always someone out there that is looking to learn what you have to teach. Now you have to put that into perspective and, and just think about whether you want to, what type of business you want to build, right? So you could certainly sell a $9 um, audiobook or you can sell an ebook or you can sell a physical book. There are so many ways to, you know, where you can put your knowledge. But my focus is on people who are looking to teach and tutor and consult um, online. So it must be someone who's looking to start an online service-based business. So I'm not teaching people how to create a Shopify store. I'm not teaching people how to do Amazon drop shipping. Uh, I'm looking for people who are knowledgeable about a subject, who want to provide uh, tutoring, consulting, or coaching online. Um, now, having said that, there are some people that come to me uh, looking for the advice that I give businesses, which is consulting on strategy and consulting on um, giving them feedback on their apps and websites. Uh, but I do that mostly for bigger companies, not for uh, smaller companies. But I have seen um, I have seen clients and I have helped clients with their uh, cloud-based SaaS, um, uh, you know, companies. But my um, um, basically, basically, uh, what you are asking is the online solopreneur um, offer. So that one is the one where people are looking to start a business that is online, service based, and um, you know they they have the knowledge that they have to share. Now there are some nuances there, uh, but we can get there uh, later or some other day. Okay. And what is next for you? Do you have any any goals, any any direction that you're you haven't yet reached? Yes. Um, so I always have something to look forward to. Uh, I think that's another thing that I have learned in life. Uh, you need to have some sort of uh, mission and or vision. Um, and there is something that you should be looking forward to to doing. Otherwise, then what's what's the point? Um, so I am looking forward to adding uh, an offer around nutrition in the future. Um, that's not necessarily something that is going to happen, but it's I'm, I'm kind of like in the process of developing a plan and the strategy to figure out if that's something really that I want to do and, and that, you know, that there is a market for it. I'm sure that there are many, many, many uh, companies offering these services that I have in mind. Um, but what I would like to do is help people transform their lives completely. Uh, around the pillars that uh, that I have learned. So money, business, health. Um, and the only th the only other thing that I, I would be missing would be the relationships uh, side of things. So I would have to um, partner with someone that is uh, knowledgeable about that area. But the pillars that I would want to focus on are uh, money, money and finances, um, you know, wealth, businesses, and then um, health. Well, Kate, it was a real pleasure talking with you today. Um, we'll put your socials in the show notes and direct people to katebernal.com. Is there anywhere else you'd like to point people to follow what you're doing? Sure. They can actually follow me on LinkedIn uh, as well and on X. Uh, I'm actually thinking about probably starting a, a YouTube channel, but that's something that's, that will be part of the plan probably for the next year or two. Um, but you never know. Maybe maybe the YouTube bug will bite me and then I'll probably start it earlier. But I think that's that's the plan for now. Well, I look forward to it when you do. Thanks again.